Hello, my name is Carissa, and today I'm going to be presenting a regression analysis in both the frequentist and Bayesian paradigms, and I will be using JAS statistical software. The data set that I'm using is uh, publicly available through the personality project, and um, specifically what I'm interested in looking at, um, I have my null hypothesis here that the beta coefficients of jury Q for quantitative, jury V for verbal, and jury A for analytical skills are equal to zero. Um, and my alternative hypothesis is that at least one of the beta coefficients of these variables is not equal to zero. So to get started with the analysis, let's go over here. Um, so the first thing that I did is I went ahead and I wanted to look at some descriptive statistics for the variables that we're interested in. Um, and then I also went ahead and just selected the correlation plots um, box to see how the variables relate to each other. Before actually doing a regression analysis, I always like to check that the assumptions of a linear regression are being met. So in this case, um, I was going to um, eyeball it here, and then I'll look at the residuals when I actually run the analysis. But the first assumption is linearity. And this is that the um, outcome variable or response variable, which is GPA in this case, um, should be linearly related to the predictors. And the predictors are jury, verbal, quantitative, and analytical skills. So I can go ahead and look at GPA. Um, and see that it looks like that there is a linear relationship with these variables. It looks like as GPA increases, it looks like these scores tend to increase as well. Um, in terms of um, homoscedasticity, and um, which is essentially the air variance of the predictor, we want it to be constant across this line. Um, and when we're looking at the relationship again between the predictors and the outcome variable, these dots are pretty evenly distributed um, across this line. And so this looks pretty good. It looks like neither one of those assumptions are violated. In terms of um, normality of residuals, we'll look at that in a second. But we can also see that all of our variables are normally distributed, which is great as well. So um, this is a good case of where our assumptions appear to all be met. Um, it is important to check for assumptions because if they're violated, then the linear regression may not be the best model to actually do whatever you know analysis you're you're trying to accomplish. And it might also just suggest that your data aren't linearly related in the way that you're um, suggesting, which could lead to poor predictions. So to get started with the actual regression analysis, we'll go ahead and select regression linear regression under classical. Um, and then we can drag and drop our outcome variable of GPA to the dependent variable box. And then our predictors, we can just go ahead and put those in the covariates box. And then JAS will automatically populate a table like this. Um, looking at this, we can see that our R squared value is about 0.28, meaning that these um, predictors explain about 28% of the variance in GPA. Um, and then this model in itself is statistically significant, meaning that we can reject the null hypothesis and say that this um, effect is reliably different from zero. And then looking at the coefficients, we have three predictors. We have our unstandardized coefficients and their standard error our standardized coefficients, and then the test statistic and p-values. Our intercept, uh, jury verbal and jury analytical writing skills are all statistically significant, meaning that if we repeated this study with the same sample over and over and over again, the long run probability of observing results that are, um, or observing data that are as extreme or more extreme than what we observed is not very likely. Um, to actually interpret these numbers, we would say that for every one unit increase in jury analytical writing skills, GPA increases by 0 0.002, um, controlling for the other variables in the model. Similarly, with the 
jury verbal score, we would say that for every one unit increase in jury verbal, it looks like GPA decreases by a very small number, um, 10 to the negative four, we would take this decimal place out four places. Um, and this is not entirely surprising. Remember that the GRE scores are on a much different scale than GPA. So for example, the minimum score of GRE verbal is 138 and the max is 873. Whereas for GPA, the min is 2.5 and the maximum is 5.38. So any change in the GRE scores is gonna be associated with a much smaller change in GPA. Now, uh, we did have one effect that was not statistically significant. And this just means that there's not enough evidence to uh, detect a statistically significant effect. Now, again, there's some nice residual plots that we can look at. And this is useful for just making sure that we aren't violating any assumptions. I'm gonna look at the covariates and let's do that. Okay, so here we have the residuals for each of the predictors. And as we can see, again, they're evenly distributed on both sides of the line. We don't see any funneling. So again, um, the assumption of most good elasticity is met. Our uh, residuals are normally distributed and they also kind of stay on this diagonal line. So again, um, we are just reaffirming that there is normality of residuals. To interpret these results, we could say that we conducted a linear regression examining if GPA is predicted by GRE quant, GRE verbal, and GRE analytical writing skills. The model with these variables explained a small amount of the variance in GPA. The intercept, the slope coefficient of GRE verbal, uh, and the slope coefficient of GRE analytical writing skills are reliably different from zero. However, there is not enough evidence to detect a statistically significant effect of GRE quant on student GPA. And we'll do um, as similar as before, we're gonna select regression. Now we're gonna select linear regression under Bayesian. And let's go ahead and drag and drop GPA to the dependent variables box. That's our outcome variable. And we'll take our predictors and put them in the covariates box. You get a nice, table um, and let's go ahead and we'll also click posterior summary so we can see what the summary of our coefficients is. So starting up here, actually one last thing, let's, so right now the default adjust is to compare to the best model because as we can see, it outputs a table with all of the possible models. So if I have three variables um, that would make uh, six possible models plus the null model. So um, instead, I want to compare to the null model. Right now, it's comparing everything to the best model. So let's compare to the null because we're doing a hypothesis test. And we have our models here. Uh, this is our model prior. So in the Bayesian framework, again, we're going to have a prior on our actual models. And then we're also, we have a prior on our regression coefficients. And we can see that down here. So our model prior currently is a beta binomial A1, B1 prior. And this prior is the default because it, um, it assumes that all model sizes are equally likely before observing the data. So, if we made it a uniform prior, for example, we'd be saying that all models are equally likely like this. And notice that they all have the same prior. However, that means that a model with three variables has the same prior probability as a model with one variable. And so depending on your problem and what your assumptions are, that may not be advantageous. So for my case, I want to make sure I'm weighting the priors um, considering the size of the model. So that's what is happening here. Um, notice that the models with three variables or the null model have a higher prior probability than the models with one or two variables. So in this column here, we have the posterior probability of the models. Um, so in other words, now that we've collected data, we've observed the data, 
how likely are the models um, now? And so again, prior probabilities go from zero to one because it's a probability. So it looks like the um, highest posterior probability is um, the second model here, about 81%. In this third column, we have the base factor of the model odds. And essentially, to get the base factor of the model odds, we take the prior odds, or the prior divided by the sum of all of the other priors. Um, and we do the same with the posterior. So we take, again, the posterior divided by the sum of all the other posteriors. And you take that posterior odds divided by the prior odds to get your base factor of the model odds. And this is often called like an updating factor. So in this case, looking at the second number, if we divide our posterior odds for this um, model by the prior odds, we get an updating factor of 46.72. Or in other words, after observing the data, the odds of this model have like increased a lot. They've increased um 42 point or 46.72 by or by a factor of 46.72 in this next column we have the Bayes factor itself um and this is just essentially our base factor of each model relative to the null model because again we're comparing the models to the null model which is not super informative right now because these are all really 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 large numbers and are so this is telling us that all of the models are a lot better than the null model, but it's not super useful when we're trying to say, well, which model is the best? So um, we'll look at that in a second. And then we have our R squared values here, which are the exact same as they would be in the frequentist paradigm. Um, these first two models have an R squared of 0.28, and then it drops off um, subsequently. So to kind of figure out what our best model is, the best, no pun intended, no. The best way to go is to compare it to the best model. Um, and then what we're going to do is flip it to a base factor of zero, one, which is then going to put the best model in the numerator so we can better interpret our base factors. So for example, uh, you, this first row, if you compa compare the best model to itself, you get a value of one, right? Because the model over the model equals one. But now if we look at the second row, um, we can interpret this number to mean that this first model, our best model, is about 13 times better at explaining the data compared to this second model in the second row. And you can do that for all subsequent models. So now coming down to the um, posterior summary, I'll just go ahead and can collapse this. We have our coefficients, we have our probability of inclusion and of exclusion in these sum to one. And now we have our posterior probabilities of inclusion and exclusion. So now that we've seen the data, what is the new probability that we would um, expect? And then we have our base factor um, of inclusion. So now that we've observed the data, our prior odds for including uh, jury verbal, for example, in the model have increased by a factor of 185.73. So this would be strong evidence for including it in the model. Um, again, same with jury analytical skills, another big number. So now that we've observed the data, um, including this variable as a predictor has um, increased by a factor of 7.748. Um, times 10 to the 26th power. However, we can see that this number here for jury quant is less than one. And so this is suggesting that um, the evidence in terms of actually including this variable in the model have decreased by um, a factor of 0.23, or we can flip it to make it easier to interpret. Um, here we have our mean and SD for the model coefficients. And notice that these are extremely comparable to um, what we observed in the frequentist framework. And then we have our 95% credible intervals for the uh, coefficients. One last thing I wanted to touch on was I just used the default prior 
um, in JASP for regression analysis on the regression coefficients. And this is a JZS um, prior with an R scale of 0.354. There's other prior options and there's some great information on priors um, when reviewing some of the references that they include for their analyses, which I would highly recommend. So now if I wanted to actually interpret this information and report it, to interpret the results, we could say that we conducted a linear regression examining if GPA is predicted by GRE quant, GRE verbal, and GRE analytical writing skills. We applied a beta prior to the models, which assumes that the model sizes are equally likely before observing any data. And we applied a JCS prior with an R scale of 0.354 to the regression coefficients. The model with GRE verbal and GRE analytical writing skills explained a small amount of the variance in GPA. Both GRE verbal and GRE analytical writing um, provide extreme evidence for being included in the model. There is moderate evidence supporting that we should not include GRE quant in the model. And if we flip this base factor for inclusion, so we can get the base factor for exclusion, 0.23, so we did one divided by 0.23, we get a value of 4.35. Or in other words, um, we have moderate evidence supporting that we should not include GRE quant in the model. Thank you for watching, and I will see you next time.